Um, my name is Rotem Geva and I'm glad to welcome you to our workshop uh, Historical Information and Moral Judgment of World War II in the, in the Holocaust, the view from North Africa. The workshop is organized by our ERC project, Judging Histories. We will open the briefings from Professor Gavinia, the principal investigator of the project. Uh, I'm honored to introduce Professor Dino. Dan Dino is a professor of modern history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he is the principal investigator of the European Research Council Advanced Grant Project, judging histories, experience, learning, and representation of World War II in an age of globalization. Professor Dino has written extensively on a wide range of topics in the fields of modern European history. Jewish history, Holocaust studies, the Middle East, and the Arab world. His scholarship has constantly drawn connections between these historiographical themes, mostly treated separately. His preoccupation with epistemological questions has yielded the concept rupture in civilization. Another important aspect of his work has been focused on the peripheral form of history and inverting the relationship between central and periphery in historiographical analysis. Dino was the director of the Zimon Dugnov Institute for Jewish History and Culture at the University of Leipzig from 1999 to 2014. In Leipzig, he has been directing the long-term project Encyclopedia of Jewish European Culture, a project that reconceptualizes Jewish history in the modern period. Dino has written numerous books and articles, among his publications are Beyond the Conceivable Studies on Germany, Nazism, and the Holocaust, Cataclysm, A History of the 20th Century from Europe's Edge, and Lost in the Sacred by the Muslim World to Scale. His most recent book, which came out this year in Germany, quotes the, rep the reparations agreement between West Germany and Israel signed in 1950. Dino has been a visiting scholar at numerous research centers in Europe and the US and has received several awards, including the Ernst Bloch Prize of the City of Ludwig Schaffen and the 2007 Basel. Please join me with you. Thank you, Artem. I was not aware that I would be presenting in such a way, but uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I would like to welcome you to our first uh, workshop uh, of our ESC Advanced Grant Project, Judging History. And uh, thanks, Rotten. Uh, I will not go into details uh, concerning uh, the framework, but will adjust or well uh, scrutinize into some aspects which might be of importance uh, to uh, our uh, workshop. Well, just to make it very, very short, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, the Second World War, the history of the Second World War, was at the core concerning the years late, late of the 1930s and, and the 40s. In the late 70s, or in the historiography in the 80s and 90s, the Holocaust was moving into the center. And the Second World War was somehow retreating uh, at a backdrop. And there was no direct relation anymore concerning the writing of the Holocaust at the backdrop of the Second World War. And our project intends to reintegrate the Holocaust into the events uh, of uh, the Second uh, World War. Our project, well, is mostly situated at the so-called, let's put it like that, the periphery, if we are putting Germany at the center. As you might know, the decision by the Allies was Germany first, and the whole the military strategy, the logistics and everything was related to that military aim. Our interest is, well, to scrutinize into the Second World War from the non-European uh, periphery, the so-called Asian non-European or colonial gaze on the two theaters of the Second World War. Firstly, the separation of the two theaters. Uh, 
well from as a result of an event of uh, utmost importance, which is not really at the focus of the research concerning the Second World War. I'm talking about the Japanese-Soviet War of 1939. That war brought about the separation of the two series. Second, focusing on the British imperial or colonial realm. I'm talking especially about the domain between, let's say, Burma, the Burmese, uh, British Indian uh, border, and the Eastern Mediterranean. That is of, it's of an utmost importance for our project, from the fall of the fortress of Singapore uh, up to the battle of El Alamein, well, which puts Palestine at the core of our interest and and the broader and the broader Middle East. And then a different uh, domain and the specificity of the French of the French of the French constellation. Well, France, as you know, withdraw of war in, in June 1940, which was not yet the Second World War. The Second World War started with the onslaught, onslaught of the German Wehrmacht of the Soviet Union and with the Japanese, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The French constellation is extremely important for epistemological reasons because France is situated on a horizontal, on a horizontal perspective, the east, west eastern perspective of European history. And I don't want to go deeply into the 19th century. Also, the last third of the 19th century might be of importance for the interpretation or reinterpretation of France reaction in summer 1940. So France on the one hand on the horizontal vector of the history of the Second World War and France being situated on the north south south north vector. France as a colonial as a colonial empire as a colonial country and that France continued the war, well, I'm not talking only about the Free French, but about the juxtaposition between the Vichy government and between uh, the Free French. So that makes North Africa, that brings North Africa at the focus of uh, our interest. 1940, France is withdrawing from the war. And I'm exaggerating for reasons of understanding and meaning. And France is returning to the war in 1944-45, but in its colonial empire. And it continues that war until the year of 1962. A very unique constellation. France not participating in the Second World War proper, beginning in the year of 1941, summer, and winter 1941, and continuing its wars after 1944-45 into China, Madagascar, and North Africa. That's indeed unique, concerning especially concerning the memory of the Second World War in the realm of North Africa. And don't want, I don't have to, and that's not my intention just now. For instance, just to focus on the massacre of Satif. Uh, May 8, 1945, concerning the memory of Algeria and other events. So, the view of North Africa, and that is our first workshop, is for us extremely important, from especially of, out of epistemological reasons concerning the interpretation and reinterpretation of the Second World War from, let's put it like that, from the non-European periphery. Also, we are aware of it, always aware of it, that the core of the war happened on the European continent, and the event, the most, well, yeah, iconic event of the war, the Holocaust, happened in Europe. But for us, the gaze from the periphery is of interest. So, thank you very much of First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Samir Ben Ayashi of having organized the workshop. 
and he is our, well, our person concerning the North African theater. And then I would like uh, to thank uh, Iris Lafon, who is coordinating, the academic coordinator of our project, Rachel Maschmol, the administrative coordinator, and Yo Hada. So I would like to wish you, I would like to wish us a very fruitful uh, workshop. It's the first workshop in a series of workshops and of conferences, and I hope that it will be successful and interesting. Thank you very much. seeing you all you know here in one room because I know that you've been working with each other for a long time and you know each other and I know you so I'm maybe excited to speak before you normally when I don't know the people it's very easy for me but when I know them all so it's maybe uh, it makes me maybe nervous but as soon as I start <laughs> as soon as I start to, to read so it will be fine so uh, Okay, so the, the film, The Battle of Algiers, 1966, in the film, there is a famous scene of a press conference where Colonial Philippe Mathieu, who plays the role of the French General Jacques Massu, was asked by the journalist about the torture that his soldier afflicted to Algerians to defend himself. This is what he said. We're neither madmen nor sadists. Those who call us Nazis don't know some of us survived Dachau and Buchenwald. We are soldiers. Our duty is to win. It is my turn to ask you the question. Should France stay in Algeria? If your answer is still yes, then you must accept all the consequences. Colonel Mathieu draw a historical parallelism between the French resistance and the Nazi camps on one side, and the military mission that he and his soldier were sent to accomplish in Algeria on the other side. By doing so, Colonial Mathieu had put the FLN's militarism, that he termed terrorism, and torture on the same footing of equality. In other words, he historically juxtaposed two turns two historical acts, two practices, which both incarnate violence, terrorism, and torture. Both, but both were norm, morally judged in two completely different ways by the actors themselves who practice the violence. So, it is this juxtaposition of historical events, this historical parallelism, this dual historical perception, this apology, and this moral judgment of history that stands at the core idea behind the rationale of our workshop. If the press conference scene that I am alluding to become, has become a cult scene in the history of cinema and also in post-colonial studies, 
for the North African youth who watch and rewatch the film several times in their life, this scene passed unnoticed, and Colonel Matthew's line as well passed unnoticed. If this line sounds to you so clear, eloquent, and understandable, for millions of North Africans, it doesn't mean much. Not only this, but the line is inaudible to North African ears, for it refers to a system of knowledge, moral system, and a, and a semantic field that are unknown to most of North African people. If the Ho and Buchenwald don't exist in your lexicon, you simply don't hear these two words, the same two words which have a completely different resonance in European ears and in continental consciousness. Moreover, the fact that the names of these two concentration camps are serving Colonel Matthew apologetical reasoning doesn't help them to be grasped and perceived by the North African audience. I remember when we watched and rewatched the Battle of Algiers back in the 80s, what mattered for us was that Saad Yassif and Ali Lapointe won't be caught by the French soldiers. Colonel Mathieu was the bad guy, so we didn't listen to his lines. Following this logic, I would ask a hypothetic question. What if the film screenwriter had put French resistance to Nazism along with the two camps, Dachau and Buchenwald, in the mouth of Saad Yassif as an apology for terrorism, in similar way that Colonel Mathieu is using them as apology for torture? What effect would that have had on North African audience? In any case, it would not have sounded plausible to put Dachau and Buchenwald in the mouth of Saad Yassif or Ali Lapointe or Zohra Darif, the armed, the armed militants of the FLA. Their Algerian and North African system of historical references couldn't have drawn any parallelism or made any juxtaposition between French resistance to Nazism on the one side and Algerian resistance to French, colonial and, uh, to French colonialism and torture on the other side of the equation. The Battle of Algiers, Colonel Mathieu is a fictional, is for a fictional character, but his line is not a pure fiction. It is part of the truth. They were indeed among the paratroops dispatched to Algeria to establish the order in the Caspa of Algiers, those who were indeed involved in the resistance who fought Nazism and fascism, who survived death and torture in the Nazi camps, and later on went to Algeria to flirt again with death camps and torture, but this time not as victims, but as hangmen. Here I would not, I would not ask the inevitable moral question, how it is possible that those who suffered, uh, who, who survived, the Nazi camps there to practice torture on the bodies of the human beings, regardless of the context and whatever the circumstances might have been, or what human beings are capable to do to the other human beings. This is not the moral judgment we are interested in in this project. Instead, I would rather ask a twofold intertwined questions. The first is historical, and the second is methodological. One, were there other French people who survived the Nazi camps and were dispatched to Algeria to be on the side of the victims, the colonized people, the tortured? And the second question, if the answer is yes, could it be methodologically possible to draw a parallelism and or juxtaposition of their human experience as survivors of the Nazi camps and then as saviors? of Algerians from torture during the Algerian war. As for the first question, yes, there were several people who survived the Nazi camps and later on supported the Algerians in their struggle against colonialism and denounced the torture and the violence that France, their home country, was practicing in Algeria. Some of these figures even made the trip to Algeria to support the Algerians. One of these figures is Germain Tillion. Germain Tillion, who has entered the Pantheon 
On May 27th, last month, Tyrion was a member of the resistance group known as the Musée de l'Homme. She was one of the four leaders of the organization, the only one who survived. One of them was shot and the other, and the other two died during deportation. Tillion works as ethnologist at the Musée de l'Homme, and in 1934, she was sent to Algeria on scientific mission within the framework of colonial enterprise to work on the Berber-speaking population in the Ores. Tillion admitted that she had thought that she would work on primitive society, but she discovered peasant France. Her mission in the Ores was inter interrupted in May 1940, and she returned to the occupied France with a suitcase full of, of ethnographic data that she had accumulated from her field work on the peasant society of the Algerian hinterland. She immediately joined the resistance network of the Musée de l'Homme, but she was betrayed by a priest and arrested by the Gestapo on August 13, 42. She was then deported to Ravensburg with the same suitcase, with the data that she had collected from Algeria. I find it very symbolical that a data collected in the ORS of a colon on a colonial scientific mission, on, on a colonial scientific mission in Algeria, found its way to Ravensburg and then got lost there and disappeared forever. A suitcase. I am wondering if this symbolism may upset the limits and also the lines of flight between the center and the periphery, the periphery and the center, or do we need more concrete and more convincing proofs to blur, to blur the borders between continental and colonial histories? I am wondering what a historian or philosopher of history can do with this symbolism which transgresses all the historical borders and limits that we know. I am wondering if such links can open or permit for new possibilities to create new worlds and invent new horizons. Tillion survived the Rappen's book. She was freed in 45, and 10 years later, she found herself again in Algeria, exactly in 1955 to you to see how she could help improve the Franco-Muslim Franco relations. She again returned to Algeria in 1957, when, when the Casbah of Algeria was under siege. This time she returned as a member of the International Commission on Internment to investigate the torture that French soldiers and police were inflicting to Algerians. During 1957, the bloodiest and most cruel year in the entire war of Algeria, Tillion had two clandestine interviews with Saadi Yassif, Zohra Drif, and Ali Lapouane, the members of what the French called l'Organisation Terroriste and the Algerians called Le Réseau Bomb du FLA, Bomb Network of the FLA. In her historical account, France and Algeria complementary enemies, Tillion reports the entire interview with Saadi Yassif in a chapter called Testimony of a Man Condemned to Death. One can find in this chapter the, seed, the first seeds for possible epistemological parallelism and or juxtaposition of historical events and practices. Their historicism, along with, with moral judgment of both, the people, the doers of these very historical events and the practices, and also those who wrote about them, the fabricators of discourses and the designers of historical narratives. The conversation led Tillion and the three militants of the FLN to embark on several subjects, among others, the undeveloped nations. That was the term in use at that time. Tillion mentioned Famine saying that she was the only person in that room who knows exactly how one went about dying of hunger, alluding to her uh, life in Ravensburg, without mentioning the name of the F the name of the camp to the FLA militants. Please here pay attention here to what I may call the semantic check and balance. Then she then she told a number of personal anecdotes from her life in the camp. 
and mentioned the statistics she had accounted before 42 on the causes of her arrest. She was alluding to the Gestapo without mentioning the word Gestapo to the, to the Saadi Yassi. Then she went on describing the informers who had disseminated the ranks of the resistance. That's the hardest thing to forgive, she said to Yassif. Yassif interrupted her excitedly. He said, oh, if I, wouldn't, if I would stop, I, if it would stop, I would forgive everyone. The conversation then turned for some time to the, res to the French resistance and to the suffering its partisans had endured. Saad Yassif identified with the French figures of the resistance who were in a similar situation like the one where he was stranded when Tillian interviewed him. It was exactly at that moment when Yassif and his friend began to tell her about the tortures that were inflicted in Algeria and particularly in Algiers. Tillian told them that she was almost as informed on the subject as they were and that this was in fact the reason for her presentry. She explained what, what the International Commission on Interrogation was. She told them that no, no, no communist French deportees had requested this investigation, that these deportees belong, uh, belong to extremely various groups and, and parties, but that they were all patriots and had not taken this decision lightly. In other words, that their ambition was not to fill the papers with the faults committed by their country, France, but to bring them to halt. When Tillion mentioned the terrorist attacks perpetuated by the FLN against the European uh, population and also against the Algerians who opposed them, like in the case of Milusa massacre, 1957, Yassif interrupted her and said, you see that we are neither criminals nor, nor murders. Very sadly, but very firmly, she answered, you are murders. Yassif was so startled that he said nothing for a moment and seems to be choking. In fact, Yassif's line, we are neither criminals nor murders, Almost sounds almost like Colonel Matthews line in the press conference. We are neither madman nor sadist. We are here before two different situations and yet they are identical. The apology for torture versus the apology for terrorism. But together they become an apology for violence. The historical situation where you have victims and hangmen on both sides. And the question what I would ask in this context and also in this workshop, how can we bridge epistemologically these two human experiences? How as historians can we understand and judge these events? To paraphrase Mark Bloch concerning the profession of the historian as an artisan of historical craft. If am I, if I am mentioning Mark Bloch, I would also like to borrow from him his skillful methodologically uh, methodology of parallelism and juxtaposition of historical events facts words semantics emotions and intentions which are not necessarily necessarily related by the force of time or space nor by the links of causality the relation between cause and effect neither by the similarity of actions and inactions the only possible similarity that connects them and which allows us to juxtapose them and draw a parallel between them is their emotional consequences, their symbolism, their physical after effects that, that they have on the human body and psyche forever. In other words, their value as a human experience, their ability to happen in a, in a given time and space and their capacity to mark individuals and groups in their profound intimacy and consciousness. To ask the same question more concretely and more directly, how can we epistemologically, semantically, philosophically, and morally juxtapose on the same footing of historical equality? The Gestapo, Ravensbrück, the whole 
Buchenwald, Germain Tillion, French Resistance, Free French, General Massu, General Dabour, Torture, Terrorism, Melotentism, The Réseau Bomb du FLN, Saad Yassif, Zohra Drif, Ali Lapointe, French Colonialism and Decolonization in North Africa. How can one link all these elements and think them as one historical package or historical ensemble? How can we understand and morally judge historical events as the link of one historical chain? How can we morally judge these historical events without playing the role of a judge and without pronouncing any value judgment, without making any moral ex exclamation of the sort that I have already mentioned, what human beings can do to other human beings? To what extent am I allowed to compare a fictional scene from a film with a real conversation that took place with real people, Tillion and Yassi, to reach a historical understanding? How can we identify the historical characters, decipher their semantics, analyze their language, scrutinize the grammar that hold their system of moral judging in order to enter their mind and heart, to be able to understand them. Mark Bloch, who is reasoning behind my words, opts for understanding instead of judging, as the essence of the task of the historian. However, there will be almost no understanding without trying to understand how the people who had experienced this event, the people on both sides, had morally judged their heroes and their victims, how they historically perceived and morally judged the events and themselves, and not less importantly, how they felt about the events and about themselves. This is what I mean more by morally judgment, as an analytical tool in the hands of historians, according to my own reading of Mark Bloch. This is not the moral judgment of the historian which interests me, but the moral judgment of the people who passed through this event and also their emotions about this event. For Bloch, a true historian is not a stranger to emotions and judgments, but not his own emotions and judgments, but the emotions and judgments of the people, the subjects, objects that the historian deals with, on all the side of the historical juxtaposition in order to achieve an epistemological bridge between the historical event and the people who experienced them. The same people whom Mark Bloch says about them, I quote, a little more to understanding of people would be necessarily merely for guidance in the conflicts which are unavoidable all the more to prevent them while there is yet time. If history only renounced to false archangelic <coughs> errors, it would help us to cure this weakness. It includes a vast experience of human diversities, a continuous contact with human beings. Life, like science, has everything to gain from it, if only these contacts be friendly. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we can begin our first session. I will show the first session. Just so I, I would like, just before I move to the first session, I have just, just to thank Rachel Machmo and Leo Hadar. They, they were the two girls behind the whole, the whole city in his who held everything. Uh, Kobe as well. And the uh, Rotem, I don't they, and the the Luke's and uh, uh, and the uh, Iris uh, Nahom, uh, Dan Diner. You know, I know when you are citing names, you always get uh, in trouble because you forget our other names. <laughs> but I'm taking the risk. So uh, you know, uh, these people who who brought us here and who did lots of things uh, and big energy and big effort that uh, this uh, workshop uh, will succeed. So thank you very much. Okay.